మాస్ మీడియాలో క్వశ్చన్ వన్ ఎక్స్ప్లెయిన్ ద గ్రౌండ్స్ ఆఫ్ రిస్ట్రిక్షన్స్ దట్ కెన్ బీ ఇంపోజ్డ్ ఆన్ ఫ్రీడమ్ ఆఫ్ ప్రెస్ కమెంట్ ఆన్ దేర్ జస్టిఫైయబిలిటీ క్వశ్చన్ టు ఎల్యూసిడేట్ ద కన్స్టిట్యూషనాలిటీ ఆఫ్ సెన్సర్షిప్ ఆఫ్ ఫిల్మ్స్ ఇన్ ద లైట్ ఆఫ్ రీసెంట్ ఈవెంట్స్ అండ్ జ్యుడిషియల్ ప్రొనౌన్స్మెంట్స్ క్వశ్చన్ త్రీ right to information is now a statutory right as well as a constitutional fundamental right discuss question 4 evaluate on the impact of visual and non visual media on people's minds with the support of leading case law question 5 freedom of speech and of the press lay at the foundation of all democratic organizations for without free political discussion no public education so essential for the proper functioning of the process of popular government is possible elucidate question 6 explain the direct impact of taxes on circulation of the media question 7 write a note on trial by media question 1 explain the grounds of restrictions that can be imposed on freedom of press comment on their justiciability grounds of restrictions it is necessary to maintain and preserve freedom of speech and expression in a democracy so also it is necessary to place some restrictions on this freedom for the maintenance of social order because no freedom can be absolute or completely unrestricted Accordingly, under Article 19, 2, of the Constitution of India, the state may make a law imposing reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right to freedom of speech and expression in the interest of the public on the following grounds. Clause 2 of Article 19 of the Indian Constitution contains the grounds on which restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression can be imposed. Security of state. Security of state is of vital importance and a government must have the power to impose a restriction on the activity affecting it. Under Article 19, 2, reasonable restrictions can be imposed on freedom of speech and expression in the interest of the security of state. However, the term security is a very crucial one. The term security of the state refers only to serious and aggravated forms of public order e.g. rebellion, waging war against the state, insurrection and not ordinary breaches of public order and public safety, e.g. unlawful assembly, riot, affray. Thus speeches or expression on the part of an individual, which incite to or encourage the commission of violent crimes, such as, murder are matters which would undermine the security of state friendly relations with foreign states in the present global world a country has to maintain a good and friendly relationship with other countries something which has the potential to affect such relationship should be checked by the government keeping this thing in mind this ground was added by the constitution first amendment act 1951. The object behind the provision is to prohibit unrestrained malicious propaganda against a foreign friendly state, which may jeopardize the maintenance of good relations between India and that state. No similar provision is present in any other constitution of the world. In India, the Foreign Relations Act, 12 of 1932, provides punishment for libel by Indian citizens against foreign dignitaries. Interest of friendly relations with foreign states would not justify the suppression of fair criticism of foreign policy of the government. However, it is interesting to note that member of the Commonwealth including Pakistan is not a foreign state for the purposes of this constitution. The result is that freedom of speech and expression cannot be restricted on the ground that the matter is adverse to Pakistan. Public Order Next restriction prescribed by constitution is to maintain public order. This ground was added by the constitution, 
First Amendment Act. Public order is an expression of wide connotation and signifies that state of tranquility which prevails among the members of political society as a result of internal regulations enforced by the government which they have established. Here it is pertinent to look into meaning of the word public order. Public order is something more than ordinary maintenance of law and order. Public order is synonymous with public peace safety and tranquility. Anything that disturbs public tranquility or public peace disturbs public order. Thus communal disturbances and strikes promoted with the sole object of accusing unrest among workmen are offenses against public order. Public order thus implies absence of violence and an orderly state of affairs in which citizens can peacefully pursue their normal avocation of life. Public order also includes public safety. Thus creating internal disorder or rebellion would affect public order and public safety. But mere criticism of government does not necessarily disturb public order. The words, in the interest of public order, includes not only such utterances as are directly intended to lead to disorder but also those that have the tendency to lead to disorder. Thus a law punishing utterances made with the deliberate intention to hurt the religious feelings of any class of persons is valid because it imposes a restriction on the right of free speech in the interest of public order since such speech or writing has the tendency to create public disorder even if in some case those activities may not actually lead to a breach of peace. But there must be reasonable and proper nexus or relationship between the restrictions and the achievements of public order. Decency or morality. The way to express something or to say something should be a decent one. It should not affect the morality of society adversely. Our constitution has taken care of this view and inserted decency and morality as a ground. The words morality or decency, are words of wide meaning. Sections 292-294 of the Indian Penal Code provide instances of restrictions on the freedom of speech and expression in the interest of decency or morality. These sections prohibit the sale or distribution or exhibition of obscene words, etc. in public places. No fixed standard is laid down till now as to what is moral and indecent. The standard of morality varies from time to time and from place to place. Contempt of court. In a democratic country judiciary plays a very important role. In such situation, it becomes essential to respect such an institution and its order. Thus, Restriction on the freedom of speech and expression can be imposed if it exceeds the reasonable and fair limit and amounts to contempt of court. According to Section 2, contempt of court may be either civil contempt or criminal contempt. But now, Indian contempt law was amended in 2006 to make truth a defense. However, even after such amendment, A person can be punished for the statement unless they were made in public interest. Again in indirect tax practitioners Asan versus R.K.Jain, it was held by court that truth based on the facts should be allowed as a valid defense if courts are asked to decide contempt proceedings relating to contempt proceeding relating to a speech or an editorial or article. The qualification is that such defense should not cover up to escape from the consequences of a deliberate effort to scandalize the court. Defamation One's freedom, be it of any type, must not affect the reputation or status of another person. A person is known by his reputation more than his wealth or anything else. Constitution considers it as ground to put restriction on freedom of speech. Basically, a statement, which injures a man's reputation, amounts to defamation. Defamation consists in exposing a man to hatred, 
ridicule, or contempt. The civil law relating to defamation is still uncodified in India and subject to certain exceptions. Incitement to an offence. This ground was also added by the Constitution, First Amendment, Act, 1951. Obviously, freedom of speech and expression cannot confer a right to incite people to commit offence. The word, offence, is defined as any act or omission made punishable by law for the time being in force. Sovereignty and Integrity of India To maintain the sovereignty and integrity of a state is the prime duty of government. Taking into it into account, freedom of speech and expression can be restricted so as not to permit anyone to challenge sovereignty or to permit anyone to preach something which will result in threat to integrity of the country. Question 2. Elucidate the constitutionality of censorship of films in the light of recent events and judicial pronouncements. Cinema and judicial pronouncement. 1. Cinema and free speech. The art of colorful moving images has been termed as cinema or motion picture. Cinema is an artistic expression of ideas, stories, and often viewpoints, sometimes inspired by reality and often set to music, with the goal of enthralling, enchanting, or just entertaining the audience. Since its inception, cinema has been regarded as the most practical tool of expression. It is viewed as the medium through which the broader aspect of people and their lives is depicted on a screen, which includes many aspects of society such as social, economic, political, spiritual, or religious, all of which have a significant impact on the nation's functioning. 2. Cinema and Freedom of Expression Speech, art, literary labor, music, and other forms of expression might be considered a part of the larger conception or benevolent idea of free thought. Free cinema can be considered as a touchstone of freedom of speech because it is an intensive and powerful medium for expressing free ideas and thoughts because it allows for a deeper understanding of cultural ideals and current trends, ultimately serving as a vehicle for transformation and revolution. One might easily associate the word, free cinema, with a platform where ideas can flow freely and without constraint of any kind. Freedom of expression, in its broadest sense, can embrace a wide range of outlets through which it might be expressed. Part 3 of the Indian Constitution, which enshrines fundamental rights, considers freedom of speech and expression to be one of the most sacred. All citizens have the right to freedom of speech and expression, according to Article 19, 1, a, of Part 3 of the Constitution. Various judicial decisions are discussed later in this article to determine whether cinema, as a method of expression, is within the scope of such constitutional protection, as Article 19, 2, imposes reasonable constraints on the freedom provided by Article 19, 1, a. Reasonable restrictions on these rights can be imposed on the basis of national security, cordial relations with other states, public order, decency, or morality, or in cases of contempt of court, defamation, or incitement to commit an offence. In India, cinema is regulated by the Cinematograph Act, 1952, which establishes rules for film certification to determine on what grounds films must be certified. These standards come within the context of reasonable limitations. This legislation contains measures for regulating film exhibition, and Section 3 of the Act established the Central Board of Film Certification, CBEF a regulatory agency tasked with certifying films for public display. Three Judicial Pronouncements on Film Certification and Censorship In the case of K. A. Abbas v. Union of India before the Hornblay Supreme Court of India, 
various laws regarding cinema certification and censorship were set under the Cinematograph Act in 1983, which was challenged as infringing Article 19 1, a, of the Constitution. The appellant contended that such provisions, as stated in several sections of the Act, such as Section 5, 1, b, Section 4, and the FBIC's refusal to issue his film a certificate without multiple edits, are in plain violation of the fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression. In this decision, the Supreme Court supported cinema censorship on the grounds that films must be treated independently from other kinds of art and expression because a motion picture might elicit more intense emotions than any other kind of art. As a result, a film can be restricted for the reasons stated in Article 19 2, of the Constitution. The court determined that censorship is a permissible exercise of power in the sake of public morality and decency, based on the standard of reasonable restriction. However, in the case of S. Rangarajan V.P. Jagjeevan Ram, the Supreme Court upheld freedom of expression by overturning a Madras High Court decision that had revoked a U certificate for the film, or Oru Gramtil, on the grounds that the film, which dealt with critical aspects of government reservation policy as a theme, could cause public unrest, resulting in law and order breakdown in the state of Tamil Nadu. When the case was appealed to the Supreme Court, it was decided that, it is the state's duty to preserve freedom of expression because it is a liberty secured against the state. The state cannot claim that it is unable to deal with the hostile audience issue. While making this comment, the court also stated that the state has no right to claim that it is unable to cope with hostile audience situations. In the case of Life Insurance Corporation of India v. Professor Manubhai D. Shah, a documentary film on the Gopal Gas tragedy, which also won a national award, was selected to be screened on Doordarshan, which it refused, citing the reasons that the case for the tragedy is still pending with respect to victim compensation, and many political parties have raised various questions on the subject. The Supreme Court said, merely because it is critical of the state government is no justification to refuse the film selection and publication. Similarly, the pending compensation claims do not render the topic subjudice, thus excluding the entire film from the community. In this instance, the court also stated that a citizen has the freedom to publish, circulate, and communicate his or her opinions in order to shape public opinion on critical issues of national importance, and that any attempt to restrict this liberty would be in violation of Article 19, 1, a. After seeing so much judicial intervention in its efforts to protect freedom of speech and expression, the government or executive enacted Section 6, 1, of the Cinematograph Act 1952, which gave the board the power to overturn an appellate tribunal's FCAT, decision in matters of film exhibition or regulation but in the landmark case of Union of India V.K. M. Shankarappa, the Supreme Court declared such legislation unconstitutional and a violation of the basic structure doctrine, noting that the executive must obey all judicial orders, and that a tribunal comprised of a retired high court judge and established by statute to perform quasi-judicial functions has its decision binding on the executive, and that the government may apply for review but it cannot review or revise judicial order. Although there have been many cases or judicial precedents that have supported cinema as a form of free speech, the most recent case in which the judiciary has reprimanded or warned the Central Board of Film Certification Kbefk, on its infringement of such rights is the controversy surrounding the film, Ukta Punjab, 
which is based on the drug problem in Punjab. In addition to refusing to certify the film, the board recommended nearly 13 cuts as a requirement for certification. The Bombay High Court, however, criticized the Central Board of Film Certification for its actions and poor handling of the situation in response to the filmmaker's appeal. The court made the crucial conclusion that the board does not always have the authority to censor films. The Cinematograph Act does not contain the word censor. The board has the authority to alter the picture, but it must do so in accordance with the Constitution's guarantee and Supreme Court orders. It can be seen that the board has erroneously expanded its powers, which were originally intended to be limited to the certification of films for exhibition exclusively, to include the power to censor as well. Citizens' rights may be jeopardized as a result of the board's attitude which is frequently politically driven. 1K.A Abbas v. Union of India 2S Rangarajan v. P. Jagjeevan Ram 3 Life Insurance Corporation of India v. Prof. Manubhai D. Shah 4 Union of India v. K. M. Shankarappa 5 Anand Patwardhan v. Central Board of Film Certification 2003 6. Shri Raghavendra Films v. Government of Andhra Pradesh, 1995 Question 3. Right to information is now a statutory right as well as a constitutional fundamental right? Discuss. Introduction to RTI Act, 2005 Right to information is not merely a statutory right but also a fundamental right. Even in the case of the state of Rajasthan vs Rajnarain, it was held that public agents must be held responsible for their conduct, and they can keep secrets only in few exceptional cases. People of India have a right to know about every public act and everything that the government does for the general public. Meaning of Right to Information Right to information includes the right to access information by any public entity, as defined by the Right to Information Act of 2005. Times taking notes, extracts, or certified copies of documents or records, certified samples of material. Times obtaining information on diskettes, floppy, tapes, video cassettes or any other electronic medium, as well as printouts when the information is stored in a computer or other device. Section 2, J. Times third party refers to anyone other than the citizen requesting information, which could include a government agency. Section 2, N. Right to information as a fundamental right. Right to information is merely a statutory right created by the RTI Act, 2005, whereas it is essentially a fundamental right guaranteed by the Constitution of India. Throughout the world, RTI is seen as a key to strengthen the democracy of a country and to ensure the development of its citizens. Even in India, the government enacted the Right to Information Act in 2005, allowing transparency, autonomy, and access to information to Indian citizens. Salient Features of RTI Act, 2005 The main features of the Right to Information Act, 2005 are 1. The RTI Act extends to the whole of India. 2. All citizens shall have the right to information under this Act. 3. It is implemented after 120 days of its enactment. 4. It shall apply to public authorities. 5. The public information officer or assistant public information officer will be accountable for responding to requests for information and assisting people looking for information. 6. The fee payable will depend upon the nature of the information.
Seven specific categories of information have been exempted from disclosure under Section 8 and Section 9 of the RTI Act. Eight intelligence and security agencies specified in Schedule 2 of the RTI Act have been exempted from the ambit of the Act, subject to certain conditions. Example, Research and Analysis Wing, RO. Objectives of the RTI Act 2005. The main objectives of the Right to Information Act, 2005 are 1. As stated above, RTI Act confers on all citizens a right to information. 2. The Act establishes the RTI practice regime, government system, for citizens to gain access to information held by government agencies. This is to promote transparency and accountability in the working of every public authority. Public authority under RTI Act, 2005. Public authority under the Right to Information Act, 2005 means any authority, body, or institution of self-government established or constituted by the Constitution, any other law made by the Parliament or State Legislature, or even by notification issued or order made by the appropriate government. Section 2. H. Obligations of Public Authorities Every public authority is instructed with a duty to maintain records and publish manuals, rules, instructions, regulations etc. in its possession as prescribed under the RTI Act, 2005. Section 4, 1, A. As per Section 4, 1, B. Every public authority has to publish particular of his organization such as functions and duties, powers of officers, decision-making procedure, rules and regulations for employees, etc., within 120 days of enactment. Records under RTI Act, 2005. Under Section 2, I, of the Right to Information Act, 2005. The following things are considered as records. 1. Any document, manuscript, and files. 2. Any microfilm, microphone, and facsimile, fax, copy of a document. 3. Any image or images concentrated in such microfilm, whether enlarged or not. 4. Any other information created by a computer or any other mechanism. As a result, information refers to any type of material, such as records, documents, memos, emails, opinions, advice, press releases, circulars, and instructions. Section 2. F. Evidentiary Value of RTI Documents as per Section 63 of the Indian Evidence Act, 1872, a certified copy of documents received under the RTI Act is considered secondary evidence. Any information collected under the RTI Act is part of documents or records kept by the public authority, known as Gazette Officers. Digital Images and the Human Psych I find it instructive that some forms of visual imagery are already highly discouraged in the Islamic tradition. Islam prohibits making images of animate objects. Interestingly, you also find a prohibition on graven images in the Bible. See Exodus 20, 4, second of the Ten Commandments. Moreover, we already know how Iblis, Satan, promised Allah, SWT, that he will systematically mislead humankind by coming to them from all four sides, ambushing them on Allah's, SWT, straight path, Al-Araf 7, 16-17. With digital media as a core medium of modern communication and dissemination of information and ideas, we should be deeply concerned about its possible negative influences for our minds, hearts and soul. Below are some aspects that often remain off our radars. 
protecting the fitra. Allah, SWT, has gifted all human beings with a fitra, a natural upright disposition. Ustad Noman Ali Khan, founder and lead instructor at Bayana Institute, notes that this fitra of all human beings is under attack by a conglomerate of multiple, multi-billion dollar interests. He cites the example of the pornography industry, whose revenues exceed those of the IT sector. He reminds us that while we worry about environmental pollution, we are not serious enough about spiritual contamination. Surveys suggest children are being exposed to toxic sexual imagery at increasingly younger ages. We recognize that quite a lot of the visual imagery in the entertainment industry is outside the moral boundaries of our deen. Yet, there is a lack of urgency in guarding ourselves and our next generation from immoral, suggestive images, which attack and destroy our natural inner light. Emotive Contents and Unconscious Processing We presume, unless explicitly graphic, the visual images we see on our devices are neutral and harmless. But the images we see carry emotive content. They seek to gain our attention by arousing our curiosity, presenting a challenge, or touching our deepest fears, hopes and longings. Many of these images are so enticing precisely because they are designed by experts in the industry who understand us and our needs very well. They are designed to evoke certain emotional responses, tell a story and subtly influence the perception of the viewer. Moreover, compared to text, the brain processes visual images much faster. Text demands conscious processing, while visual content has a much more immediate impact, a great part of which can be unconscious, that is, below the level of our conscious thought. Dr. Mark Damien Delp, who has looked deeply into the effects of visual imagery on our inner life, helps us understand what that could mean. There is so much stimuli, so much data coming in on some of these images that we don't catch a fraction of it. Once it gets in, it continues to move usually unnoticed in our imaginations, and in our imaginations it settles in our memories and it becomes the grist for contemplation, good or bad. Thus the images we are exposed to are transforming our psyche. This is of crucial concern, as eventually these influences on our inner states will reflect on our outer condition and the choices we make. Some insights from neuroscience and psychological research. Activation of the brain's emotional processing regions. A literature review of neuroscience articles revealed that watching images can directly impact brain's emotion processing centers. Negative, fear-inducing images activated the amygdala, key brain region for processing anxiety, fear and pain. When exposed to highly novel or unfamiliar images, the brain struggles to provide a context, and this can be anxiety-producing. Expressions of fear on faces can generate a fear response in the viewer. Interestingly, the amygdala was more active when viewing sharp objects compared to curved ones, for example, a sofa with sharp contours versus one with curved contours. Physiological Stress Response A fear-anxiety response in the brain induced by visual images can activate a stress response in the body, including an increased heart rate and blood pressure. Such calming images as natural scenes, on the other hand, have a restorative effect on mind and body. Impact of Electronic Media Violence Dr. L. Rowell Huseman a professor of communication studies and psychology, reviewing the impact of violent media concludes, media violence increases the risk significantly that a viewer or game player will behave more violently in the short run and in the long run. 
repeated exposure to violent media can lead to emotional arousal, observational learning and desensitization to violence, all of which contribute to acts of violence. School shootings in the USA are a product of this. Fake idols and a disconnectedness from our own humanity. Millennials and young adults, who have grown up in a world surrounded by digital media, have had their very lives and thinking shaped by what they are exposed to via these media. A student from an Islamic school in the US explained to me that celebrities and the music industry were constantly in their lives. When anything related to them happened, most of the school was updated. This influence was then sometimes reflected in their own online activities. Talking about Snapchat and Facebook users she commented, they all are putting out their lives and they want everyone to see their lives similar to celebrities. What these celebrity images sell to our young minds are not the things that help them flourish as humans. False images and fake adoration are doing a lot of harm by disconnecting us from our own selves. We present an idealized image of ourselves and, therefore, hide other parts of ourselves, which are less admirable to other people, explains Dr. Michael Sinclair, a counseling psychologist. He warns there is a risk to through the land and have their hearts wherewith to understand and ears wherewith to hear. Verily, it is not the eyes that grow blind, but it is the hearts which are in the breast that go blind. al Haj 2246 Fragmented Messages The digital world presents us with multitudinous still and moving visuals, texts and sounds, which lack a continuity of narrative. We are bombarded with a stream of messages that are distracting, intrinsically unrelated, impersonal and often irrelevant to our lives. The news of a genocide could be followed by an ad of a new clothing line, followed by a clip of cute baby pandas. They quickly catch our attention and then are forgotten with equal ease. Add to that the endless ads, pop-ups, banners and notifications that clutter our screens. Confused and overwhelmed, our minds go numb. Moreover, as we consume these fragmented, restless, discontinuous images, and as they reach our inner selves, they disturb the inner stillness and tranquility of our souls. This is a matter of grave concern for people of faith. For they recognize that their strength lies in inner peace, in having a Kalbi Salim. Preserving our moral and intellectual faculties. We cannot completely disengage from the digital world, but we can become more self-aware of the harm and consciously take our lives back into our own hands. We can make viewing choices that serve us best and protect our thinking and spiritual capacities we need to develop a strategic response. Below I provide some practice advice. Times self-awareness and more mindful online behavior. The starting point is to become aware of the influence digital media and visual imagery has on your thoughts, feelings and behavior. Monitor your time spent online and be sensitive to how much influence you are taking in. Limit your screen time based on your needs. Develop new online habits that allow you access to useful information with minimum distraction and spiritual harm. Develop mental discipline to walk away from meaningless distractions, no matter how intriguing. Times seek tranquility in nature. Our minds and souls seek tranquility. Disengage frequently from the fragmented world of digital visuals to reconnect with the world of natural images. Some experiences can only be obtained away from the screen. Deliberately seek time in nature. Instead of viewing nature as Facebook opportunities, let your eyes soak in the vastness of the sky. Let your soul feel the wholeness of nature.
Remember we are reminded again and again in the Quran to reflect on the heavens and the earth. Times switch from passive viewing to active engagement. Take out time daily to read something useful. Instead of being passive recipients of digital media, engage your mind in reading. If you are reading online, make sure to use ad blocks and other software to clear up the screen from distracting clutter. Text demands the reader to participate actively in a conversation started by the author, connect ideas, build mental images, reflect and respond. As Muslims, we belong to a rich tradition of the written word, which traces back to the first revelation, the first command of Ikra, read, recite. It is essential we go back to these roots to protect and develop our critical faculties. Times seek presence in human interactions. While there have been numerous benefits of social media in terms of staying connected and updated, I strongly believe we are losing the art of enjoying each other's presence. Emoticons, likes and favorites, envy inducing photos, quotes and the like cannot replace a presence-filled interaction in the real world. Put away your smartphones and relearn how to make interesting face-to-face -face conversations. Make sure to give genuine time and attention to the people who care for you and need you. Replace digital images with meaningful memories of time spent together. Times limit your gaze. Allah, SWT, commands both the believing men and believing women to lower their gaze in Surah and nur 24, 30-31. This extends also to the digital world, and the visual images we come across daily, as we go about our day. In a time, when images are everywhere from billboards to magazines, shops, television and digital devices the only way to block them and limit their influence is to restrict our vision. Take responsibility for what your eyes are taking in and feeding your mind and soul. Times educate yourself and your children. Educate yourself and family about the Islamic perspective on life the purpose of our existence and our value system. This foundation will help you and your children acquire a more discerning attitude regarding modern media and culture, such as the awareness of ideological biases. Times protective supplications and being conscious of Allah, SWT. Develop a habit of being conscious of Allah, SWT, when browsing the web, especially in solitude. Lastly, never underestimate the power of protective morning and evening prayers. IBN al qayyim explained, the morning and evening adhkar play the role of a shield, the thicker it is, the more its owner will not be affected. Question 5. Freedom of speech and of the press lay at the foundation of all democratic organizations, for without free political discussion no public education, so essential for the proper functioning of the process of popular government, is possible. Elucidate. Introduction. There is often confusion regarding the classification of the news media. Is it a business under Article 19, 1, G, of the Constitution of India? or an activity deserving protection under Article 19, 1, a, as a right to freedom of speech and expression. This question is critical in determining the standards applicable to the conduct of the many news providing outlets in India today. The right to express opinions freely is critical in a democracy. Intellectuals have long championed it as a gateway to other liberties positing that curtailment of free expression inevitably leads to restrictions on other rights such as the right to be informed. This right, however, is confused and equated with the necessity to overlook the media as a business, falling under Article 19, 1, g, which is fundamentally flawed.
the rights of a citizen and the rights of a media business owner fall under different baskets and contours and cannot be considered the same. Freedom of speech and expression includes freedom of circulation, to the extent that the ability to propagate one's expression is inherent in that freedom. The Constitution of India does not specifically mention the freedom of press. Freedom of press is implied from Article 19, 1, A, of the Constitution. Thus the press is subject to the restrictions that are provided under Article 19, 2, of the Constitution. Before independence, there was no constitutional or statutory provision to protect the freedom of press. As observed by the Privy Council in Channing Arnold v. King Emperor, the freedom of the journalist is an ordinary part of the freedom of the subject and to whatever length, the subject in general may go, so also may the journalist, but apart from statute law his privilege is no other and no higher. The range of his assertions, his criticisms or his comments is as wide as, and no wider than that of any other subject. The preamble of the Indian constitution ensures to all its citizens the liberty of expression. Freedom of the press has been included as part of freedom of speech and expression under Article 19 of the UDHR. The heart of the Article 19 says, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Judicial Views In Romesh Thapa v. State of Madras, Patanjali Shastri, CJ observed, freedom of speech and of the press lay at the foundation of all democratic organizations, for without free political discussion no public education, so essential for the proper functioning of the process of popular government, is possible. The Supreme Court observed in Union of India v. Asan. For democratic reforms, one-sided information, disinformation, misinformation and non-information, all equally create an uninformed citizenry which makes democracy a farce. Freedom of speech and expression includes right to impart and receive information which includes freedom to hold opinions. In Indian Express v. Union of India, it has been held that the press plays a very significant role in the democratic machinery. The courts have duty to uphold the freedom of press and invalidate all laws and administrative actions that abridge that freedom. Freedom of press has three essential elements. They are 1. Freedom of access to all sources of information. 2. Freedom of publication. and. 3. Freedom of Circulation In India, the press has not been able to practice its freedom to express the popular views. In Skull Papers Limited v. Union of India, the daily newspapers, Price and Page, Order, 1960, which fixed the number of pages and size which a newspaper could publish at a price was held to be violative of freedom of press and not a reasonable restriction under the Article 19, 2. Similarly, in Bennett Coleman and Co. v. Union of India, the validity of the newsprint control order, which fixed the maximum number of pages was struck down by the Supreme Court of India holding it to be violative of provision of Article 19, 1, A, and not to be reasonable restriction under Article 19, 2. The court struck down the rebuttal of the government that it would help small newspapers to grow. In Romesh Thapa v. State of Madras, entry and circulation of the English journal, Crossroad, printed and published in Bombay, was banned by the government of Madras. The same was held to be violative of the freedom of speech and expression, as, without liberty of circulation, publication would be of little value. In Prabhaduk v. Union of India, 7, 
the Supreme Court directed the superintendent of Tihar Jail to allow representatives of a few newspapers to interview Ranga and Billa, the death sentence convicts, as they wanted to be interviewed. There are instances when the freedom of press has been suppressed by the legislature. The authority of the government, in such circumstances, has been under the scanner of judiciary. In the case of Bridge Bhushan v. State of Delhi, AIR 1950-SC 129, the validity of censorship previous to the publication of an English weekly of Delhi, the organizer was questioned. The court struck down the Section 7 of the East Punjab Safety Act, 1949, which directed the editor and publisher of a newspaper to submit for scrutiny, in duplicate, before the publication, till the further orders, all communal matters, all the matters and news and views about Pakistan, including photographs and cartoons, on the ground that it was a restriction on the liberty of the press. Similarly, prohibiting a newspaper from publishing its own views or views of correspondence about a topic has been held to be a serious encroachment on the freedom of speech and expression. Under Indian law, the freedom of speech and of the press do not confer an absolute right to express one's thoughts freely. Lord Denning, in his well-known book Road to Justice, stated that press is the watchdog to see that every trial is conducted fairly, openly and above board, but the watchdog may sometimes break loose, pointing out facts and incidences which the authorities do not wish the public to know, and has to be punished for misbehavior. With the same token clause, to of Article 19 of the Indian Constitution enables the legislature to impose certain restrictions on free speech under the following heads. 1. Security of the state. 2. Friendly relations with foreign states. 3. Public order. 4. Decency and morality. 5. Contempt of court. 6. Defamation. 7. Incitement to an offense. And. 8. Sovereignty and Integrity of India The word, obscenity, is identical with the word, indecency, of the Indian constitution. In an English case of R. V. Hicklin, the test was laid down according to which it is seen, whether the tendency of the matter charged as obscene tend to deprave and corrupt the minds which are open to such immoral influences. This test was upheld by the Supreme Court in Ranjit D. Odeshi v. State of Maharashtra. In this case the court upheld the conviction of a bookseller who was prosecuted under Section 292, IPC, for selling and keeping the book Lady Chatterley's Lover. The standard of morality varies from time to time and from place to place. The constitutional right to freedom of speech would not allow a person to contempt the courts. The expression contempt of court has been defined section 2 of the Contempt of Courts Act, 1971. The term contempt of court refers to civil contempt or criminal contempt under the Act. But judges do not have any general immunity from criticism of their judicial conduct provided that it is made in good faith and is genuine criticism, and not any attempt to impair the administration of justice. In Riyarundati Roy, the Supreme Court of India followed the view taken in the American Supreme Court, Frank Furter, J., in Pennecamp v. Florida in which the United States Supreme Court observed, if men, including judges and journalists, were angels, there would be no problem of contempt of court. Angelic judges would be undisturbed by extraneous influences and angelic journalists would not seek to influence them. The power to punish for contempt, as a means of safeguarding judges in deciding on behalf of the community as impartially as is given to the lot of men to decide, is not a privilege accorded to judges. The power to punish for contempt of court is a safeguard not for sedition. 
whoever by words, either spoken or written, or by signs, or by visible representation, or otherwise, brings or attempts to bring into hatred or contempt, or excites or attempts to excite disaffection towards, the government established by law in India, shall be punished with imprisonment for life, to which fine may be added, or with imprisonment which may extend to three years, to which fine may be added, or with fine. But explanation 3 says, commence expressing disapprobation of the administrative or other action of the government without exciting or attempting to excite hatred, contempt or disaffection, do not constitute an offence under this section. In Kedarnath v. State of Bihar, the court upheld the constitutional validity of the section 124 of I.P.C. While any restrictions of free speech and expression must be reasonable, there is no provision exhorting the individual to be reasonable in the exercise of their rights. It could be argued, in fact, that, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Nevertheless, the right to free speech and expression does not exist in a vacuum and must be balanced with other rights. It is in maintaining this balance that the idea of responsibility as part of a right comes into play. Thus the tension between freedom of expression and intervention by authorities remains. As noted above, the reasonableness of restrictions on freedom of speech are decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Any intervention by the state would be dictated by societal standards of acceptability. The laws currently in place show the state will step in to prevent violence and harm to reputations. The popular reactions to other government measures, such as the policing of the internet, show that in these cases the government seems to be going too far. Conclusion once the way is clear for the government to intervene, the extent and result of that intervention must be specified. There needs to be a clearly defined spectrum, with cautions or fines at one end, and imprisonment at the other, which can be applied to rein in infringing expressions. The punishment will, of course, depend on the circumstances of the intervention, with proportionality the key principle to follow. While individuals will have to rely on authorities being fair and just, the media industry may be able to preempt government action. If the industry was to regulate itself, any offences could be dealt with at that level. In order to maintain effective self-regulation, the industry first needs to create an architecture which supports it. In the first place, any industry association or body responsible for regulation would need universal membership. Allowing potential members to opt out defeats the point of self-regulation and leaves the system vulnerable. In addition, the association should endorse a basic code of ethics and guidelines on transparency, so that providers of news adhere to a minimum standard. Finally. It is important that this association or advisory body has real punitive powers. The threat of real and meaningful sanctions, beyond fines which may not even register with corporate-sponsored entities, must be used to ensure press quality. If an association or body within the media industry is incapable of functioning as described above, Another possible option is the introduction of an independent regulator. Such a body would need to be independently mandated and maintained. It would have to function impartially, free from both government and media control. Another important aspect of an independent regulator would be the scope of its powers. Ideally, it should cut across platforms to reflect a convergence in policy so that providers of news are held to equivalent standards no matter what their method of dissemination. Meanwhile, merging superfluous associations would increase efficiency.
The independent regulator could act in conjunction with the self-regulatory body. This would allow the industry to monitor itself, while avoiding bias by leaving the punitive powers with an independent body. As with any suggestion of introducing new laws or administrative bodies, balance is integral to the equation, the two must work in tandem. If reliance on the independent regulator is too great, then there is a risk that the regulator will act unilaterally, sidestepping legal scrutiny. At the same time, the level of discretion afforded to judges should not be such that the regulator is undermined. The judiciary and the administrative sector must support each other. Immunity from any tax specially imposed on the press on advertisements in a newspaper which was calculated to limit its circulation. Case Laws Hush Ramesh Kapur v. State of Madras The question was the scope of the freedom of circulation under Article 19, 1, a, of the Constitution. The government of Madras banned the entry and circulation of an English weekly, Crossroads, published from Bombay into the city of Madras. The Madras Maintenance of Public Order Act, 1949, permitted the state to prohibit the entry into or circulation of any document or classes of document within the state or any part of it. The petitioner contended that this provision contravened Article 19, 1, I, of the Constitution and was hence void. The state argued that the expression, public safety, in Section 9, 1-I, relates to law and order which in turn has a relation to, security of province. In other words, it amounted to imposition of reasonable restriction in the interest of security of state under Article 19, 2. However, Section 9, 1-I, specifically refers to, public safety, and the maintenance of public order, as the purpose for which any action may be taken. The question before the court, was whether to read public order as a wider concept inclusive of public safety or treat it as distinct and exclusive. If public safety and public order were treated as distinct grounds then the Madras legislature was incompetent to legislate a law in the interest of public safety. The Supreme Court held that the expression, public safety, ordinarily means security of the public or freedom from danger. If understood in that sense, then anything which affects public health may be taken to be covered by the expression public safety. The restraint on speech would not be justified in the interest of public order or public safety as they are too wide to be covered by the narrower expression. Patanjali Sastari, J. emphasized that unless a law restricting freedom of speech and expression is solely directed against undermining the security of state or overthrow of it, such a law will not be covered by Article 19, 2 although the restrictions may be in the interest of public order. Hence, it means that Section 9, 1-A, which authorized the imposition of restrictions for wider purpose of securing public safety or maintenance of public order fell outside the authorized restrictions under Article 19, 2, and therefore void and unconstitutional. This means that the expression public order and public safety must give way to security of state. An offense which endangers security of state can be restricted but not an offense covering public order. The Supreme Court did not go into the nature of the material appearing in the weekly. The decision merely stated that the government was not authorized to prevent entry of matter in the interest of public safety or in the interest of public order. The decision positively laid down that the state can impose restrictions on a newspaper only when it is made with a view to combat and prevent activities which may undermine or overthrow it. Hashvirendra v. State of Punjab, 24 
the constitutional validity of section 3 of the Punjab Special Powers Press Act 1956 was raised section 3 1 authorized the government to prohibit the entry of a newspaper leaflet or any publication if it contains matters likely to affect or prejudice maintenance of communal harmony or public order the virtual effect of Section 3 was that it completely prohibited the entry or circulation of papers published in New Delhi into the whole of Punjab. Since Section 3 did not place any time limit for the operation of any order under it or provide for representation against it, the section was held to be unreasonable and unconstitutional. Hushkal Papers, P. Limited v. Union of India 25. Uh, the Newspapers, Price and Page, Act 1956, and the Daily Newspaper, Price and Page, Order 1960 prescribed the number of pages of a newspaper and the price to be charged. The order also prescribed the number of supplement to be published, the area and the size of the advertisement matter in relation to other matters contained in a newspaper. In defiance of these Maya shores, the government contended that the intention of the order was to regulate the price charged for a newspaper in relation to their pages. It was also said that the order was a necessary sequel to the Press Commission's recommendation that unfair practices and monopolistic tendencies should be curbed. The petitioners contended that the impugned order resulted in compelling them either to raise the price of the paper if they want to maintain the present page level, or to cut down the number of pages to maintain the existing price. Either way this would result in reducing the circulation of the paper. If the price of the paper was raised, it would become unattractive to a certain class of readers. Reduction in page level leads in turn to reduction in the area of news published. This again would make the paper unattractive to the readers. In other words the act and the order was designed to curtail the freedom of press and as such violated freedom of speech and expression guaranteed under Article 19, 1, a. They contended that the order interfered with their right to disseminate news and views. The court accepting the arguments of the petitioner held that the act and the order clearly violated freedom of speech and expression guaranteed under Article 19, 1, a. The order if allowed to operate would result in curtailing the freedom of the press. As freedom of press was accepted to be part of freedom of speech and expression under Article 19, 1, a. Reasonable restrictions could only be imposed. Hush Bennett Coleman and Co. Limited v. Union of India, 26, court was again asked to examine the effect of newsprint policy of the government on the circulation of newspaper. As there was a shortage of indigenous newsprint, its import was regulated by the Import Control Order 1955 issued under Section 3 and 4 of the Import and Exports Control Act 1947. The government passed the Newsprint Control Order 1962 in exercise of its powers under Section 3 of the Essential Commodities Act 1955. The object of the Newsprint Control Order was stated to be to make an equitable distribution of it at a fair price. Clause 3 of the Newsprint Control Order placed restrictions on acquisition, sale and consumption of newsprint. Clause 3, 3, declared that no consumer of newsprint shall in any licensing period, consume or use newsprint in excess of the quantity authorized by the controller from time to time. Clause 3, 3a, further stated that no consumer of the newsprint, other than a publisher of textbooks of national interest should use any kind of paper other than newsprint except under a written permission granted by the controller. 
The central government laid down its newsprint policy for the year 1972-73. This policy placed certain restrictions on the newspapers in utilization of newsprint. They were 1. No newspaper or new edition can be started by a common ownership unit even within its authorized quota of newsprint. 2. Maximum number of pages is fixed at 10. No adjustment is allowed between circulation and the pages, so as to increase the pages. 3. No interchangeability is permitted between different papers of common ownership units in different edition of the same paper. 4.20% increase in page level up to a maximum of 10 pages has been given to papers which are having a circulation of less than 100000 and 3% increase in case of papers having circulation above 100000 The petitioners raised the question whether the newsprint control policy was a newsprint control or newspaper control. According to Mr. Palkiwala who appeared for the petitioners, the measure was the newspaper control with a degree of subtlety and sophistication. Rationing of newsprint is newsprint control. When once the quota is fixed it results in post-quota restrictions or newspaper control. In the instant case, the newspaper's control was achieved by the measures adopted in relation to common ownership units. The common ownership units were a. Prevented from bringing out newspapers or new editions of their dailies. b. Not permitted to have interchangeability of quota within their unit. The state argued that the subject matter of the import policy was rationing of imported commodity and equitable distribution of newsprint. The restrictions in fixing the page level and circulation were necessary to see that the imported newsprint was properly utilized for the purpose for which it was imported. Further, the state contended that the rationing and distribution of quota of newsprint and regulation of its supply was not a direct infringement of Article 19, 1, a. The decisions of the United States Supreme Court in Red, Lion Broadcasting Co., 27, Dot and O'Brien, 28, were cited in the support. In Red Lion's case the court held that Neither regulation nor direction with regard to medium of expression encroaches on the First Amendment right of the American Constitution. Regulatory statutes which do not control the content of speech but incidentally limit the unfettered exercise are not to be regarded as a type of law which the First Amendment of the American Constitution forbade the Congress of the United States to enact. In O'Brien's case the court held that any incidental limitation or incidental restriction was permissible if the same was essential to the furtherance of important governmental interest in regulating speech and freedom. The court held that the policy of the government to limit all papers to 10-page limit was arbitrary. It amounted to treating unequals as equals and discrimination against those who by virtue of their efficiency, standard and service and because of their all India stature acquired a higher page level. The newsprint policy failed to make a distinction between big English dailies having all India circulation and small dailies having regional circulation with regard to the allocation of newsprint. The government's policy to encourage small dailies cannot be allowed to strangulate the freedom of speech and expression of the big dailies. The newspaper should be left free to decide how they should adjust their newsprint. For the purpose of allotment of newsprint number of pages and volume of circulation of a newspaper may be relevant, but thereafter the newspaper should be left free to decide their page level volume of circulation and new editions within their quota allotted fairly. Freedom of press carries with it the right to achieve any volume of circulation. 
the growth in circulation does not mean that there should not be growth in pages. The restrictions on newspapers that they cannot use the quota of newsprint to increase circulation would therefore violative of the Constitution. Court held that the policy of the government asking all papers to limit to 10 pages was arbitrary. Such a policy may lead to treatment of unequals as equals. It may discriminate against those who by virtue of their efficiency standard and service and because of their all India stature acquired higher page level, the main source of income for newspapers is from advertisements. The loss of revenue because of the cut in page level is said to be over several lakhs of rupees. The newspapers have a built-in mechanism. Advertisements are not only the source of revenue but also one of the factors for circulation. The ceiling of pages affects the economic viability of the newspaper and also restricts the freedom of expression. Sealing of pages not only entails reduction of circulation and denudes the area of coverage of news and views but also results in reduction of space allotted for advertisement. 69 fall in advertisements makes the paper economically unviable. Hush India Express Newspapers, Bombay, PVT LTDV.UI, 29. The publishers of the newspapers are required to pay customs duty as per the provisions of the Customs Act 1962. Read with the provisions of Customs Tariff Act 1975. Further, the Finance Act of 1981 imposed an auxiliary duty of 30% ad valorem in addition to the customs duty on the consumers of newsprint. The newspapers are classified as small, medium, and big. Newspapers for the purpose of the levy. The levy of these duties was challenged in Indian Express case. While the petitions were pending in the court, the Customs Tariff Act 1975 was amended levying 40% ad valorem plus hours 1000 per metric ton as customs duty on newsprint and the auxiliary duty payable on all goods subject to customs duty was increased to 50% ad valorem. However, in view of the notifications issued under the Customs Act 1962, duty at a flat rate of hours 550 per metric ton and an auxiliary duty of hours 275 per metric ton were now levied. The petitioners who were companies engaged in the business of editing, printing and publishing newspapers and periodicals contended that the levy of customs duty and auxiliary duties had the direct effect of crippling their freedom of speech and expression guaranteed under the constitution. According to the petitioners, the imposition of levy in turn lead to the increase in the price of newspapers and the inevitable consequence would be reduction in circulation. On the other hand, the government contended that the levy of customs duty on newsprint was not strictly a levy on newsprint as such, though customs duties were levied with reference to goods. The taxable event was the import of goods within the customs barrier and hence there could be no direct effect on the freedom of speech and expression by virtue of the levy of customs duty on newsprint. Rejecting this contention, the court observed. It cannot be denied that the levy of customs duty on newsprint used in the production of newspapers is a restriction on the activity of publishing a newspaper and the levy of customs duties had a direct effect on that activity. There exists no analogy between Article 289, 1, and Article 19, 1, a, and, 2, of the Constitution. The court further observed, that though the petitioners had succeeded in showing a fall in circulating they had not placed before the court the necessary data to establish that the fall in circulation may be due to a variety of factors namely, general rise in cost of living, and management of a paper, 
change in editorial policy, the absence of certain feature writers, etc. Similarly the government also made no effort to show the effect of the impact of the levy on the newspaper industry as a whole. It is difficult to conclude on either way, that the effect of levy was burdensome so as to infringe the freedom of press or that is not so, on the basis of the materials placed before the court. The court directed the central government to review within six months the entire question of levy of customs duty or auxiliary duty payable by the petitioners with effect from 1st March 1981. The petitioners were directed to make available to the government all information necessary to decide the question. Pending redetermination of the levy the government was asked to recover only hours 550 per metric ton as customs duty and auxiliary duty. The concessions made available to medium and small newspapers were not disturbed. The court held that the classification of newspapers into small, medium and big for purpose of levying customs duty was not violative of Article 14. The distinction in the levy of duty was intended to help the small and medium newspapers to bring down their cost of production. These papers do not command large advertisement revenue. Their area of circulation is limited and majority of them are in Indian languages catering to rural section of the people. There is nothing wrong in the said classification. Hush Hamdard Davakana v Union of India 30. In this case constitutionality of the Drugs and Magic Remedies, Objectionable Advertisement, Act, 1954 in relation to Article 19. 1. A. and 19. 1. G. was considered. The act in question was intended to prevent self-medication and to prohibit advertisement suggesting remedies for all kinds of diseases and other matters connected therewith. The court held. An advertisement is no doubt a form of speech and it is so only when it is used for propagation of ideas, social, political or economic or furtherance of literature or human thought. The court quoted with approval the American Supreme Court decision in Louis J. Valentine v. F. J. Christensen where it was held that It cannot be said that the right to publish and distribute commercial advertisements advertising individuals' personal business as a part of freedom of speech guaranteed by the Constitution. Further, the constitutional right of free speech is not infringed by prohibiting the distribution in city streets of handbills bearing on one side a protest against action taken by public officials and on the other advertising matter. The constitutional validity of restrictions on advertisements was again considered in SCAL papers. In this case the plea of the state that the object of Section 3, 1, of the newspaper, Price and Page, Act 1956 in, regulating the space for advertisement was to prevent unfair competition in trade was turned down. It was held that the direct and immediate effect of the newspaper, Price and Page, Act 1956 and the daily newspaper, Price and Page, Order, was to curtail the freedom of newspapers guaranteed by Article 19, 1, A. Similarly the plea of the state that newspapers instead of raising the prices could reduce their number of pages was rejected. It was also held that the freedom of newspaper to publish any number of pages or to circulate to any number of persons was an integral part of freedom of speech and expression. Urshtaya Publications, P. Limited v. Government of Andhra Pradesh The constitutional validity of Andhra Pradesh Government Order Date 10 August 1979, directing all government departments, public sector undertakings and governments to release all their advertisements through Director, Information and Public Relations was raised. In pursuance to the Government Order, 
the Department of Information and Public Relations adopted guidelines to be followed for the purpose of allotment of advertisements to the newspapers. It was stated that advertisements were to be released so as to ensure effective and widest possible publicity. Political affiliations were not be considered in placing government advertisements. Advertisements were not to be given to newspapers or periodicals adopting any undesirable tones. The High Court held that the government had got the right to give its advertisements to such papers as it pleases and it was not open to the petitioners to contend that the government by denying the government advertisements to the paper, the freedom of press of the newspaper was violated. It further added that it cannot be denied that while giving advertisements to various newspapers the government must do so without exercising any discrimination in favor of or against any particular paper. The court quoted with approval the decision of the Supreme Court in Ramana Dayaram Shetty v. International Airport Authority of India, wherein, it was observed, whatever its activity. The government is still the government and will be subject to restraints, inherent in its position in a democratic society. A democratic government cannot lay down arbitrary and capricious standards for the choice of persons with whom alone it will deal. The court upheld the power of the government to withhold the advertisements to newspapers or periodicals adopting tones which were anti-national or communal or provoking tensions between different sections of the society, or indulging in character assassination, blackmailing and attacks on individuals or mudslinging without proper and truthful evidence and intimidation of its functionaries. The government cannot be expected to give advertisements to newspapers which make abusive or slanderous attacks on it. However, the court struck down the conditions in the guidelines namely, rabid or abusive or distorting news for mischievous purpose or fomenting group rivalries and quarrels and thereby indulging in mischievous gossip mongering and sensationalism as violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. It held, that the expression, rabid, means ragging, fanatical. It is difficult to decide whether any view expressed by the newspaper is fanatical or abusive. A newspaper may be fanatical about what it considers to be a right cause. It may be abusive against what it considers to be injurious to the society or the community. Similarly whether a newspaper distorts news for a mischievous purpose or not is difficult to determine. It is difficult to say whether the way in which news is presented amounts to distortion or whether the alleged distortion is mischievous or not. Similarly, when a newspaper takes sides with a particular group it is difficult to say that it does so for the purpose of fomenting group rivalries. Again views may vary. Whether a news item amounts to mischievous gossip mongering and sensationalism according to the view of different persons concerned. The press have a vital role to play in a democratic country. More so in a developing country like India. Now and then the press may incur the wrath of the government when it exposes the wide gulf between the promises and performances of the government. At the same time it has to be remembered that the freedom is not a license to say or publish what one pleases. The courts have a duty to see that the freedom is not abused or curbed through regulations affecting circulation. Trial by media is a phrase which is as equal as to the statement that whosoever controls the media controls the mind that has been used popularly in the last few decades to describe the impact of television and print media coverage on a case by an attempt made by the media of holding the accused guilty even prior to his trial and regardless of any verdict in the court of law. The criminal jurisprudence followed in India is based on the theory that an accused is entitled to fair trial and is innocent till proven guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. 
on account of exclusive coverage media goes a long way to cover and publish interviews of witnesses, victims' relatives, comments of the members of legal fraternity etc. which may cause prejudice to a trial proceedings in particular the judicial mind. In fact this affects the perception of public at large because media reaches out to the mass promptly. In the last decade we have witnessed rapid growth of media influence in the process of access to justice in plethora of cases relating to corruption, rape, murder, sexual harassment, terrorist activities etc. Media activism imposes an indirect pressure on the adjudicating authorities to deliver justice to victims who may interfere with the trial proceedings and may cause prejudice to the accused and the chance of proving his innocence. Trial by media means the impact of the newspaper and television coverage on a person's reputation by creating widespread perception of guilt regardless of any verdict in court of law. Freedom of media in today's world is perceived to be the freedom of the people. Also, it is gratuitous to emphasize on the fact that every citizen has a right to be cognizant on all matters affecting them through media. But is thought provoking that the media in the present day is such a powerful entity that it manipulates and builds public opinion as the word said promulgates are presumed to be true without questioning its authenticity. Media overlooks the primary idea that governs trial in India which is guilty beyond reasonable doubt and innocent until proven guilty. In order to attract more viewers the media end up maligning and tarnishing the image of mere suspects and tagging them as guilty even before the judges. Media by emphasizing on one side delegations and taking the easy route of just fueling the public outrage without trying to unearth the reality can be very damaging, which is barely considered by the media. Media has a great influence over the public of the country. Newspapers, news channels, radio and television don't only spread the information but they also assist in controlling the stories which the public may discuss later. Crimes receive a wide coverage which makes it challenging for the prosecutors and attorneys. The judiciary and the media share a common bond and play a complementary role to each other. Man is the center of their universe. While the media explores, discovers, and reveals the achievements and follies of man, the judiciary deals with the legal problems created by him. Both the judiciary and the media are engaged in the same task, to discover the truth, to uphold the democratic values and to deal with social, political and economic problems. The media, in fact, has been called the handmaiden of justice, the watchdog of society, the judiciary, the dispenser of justice and the catalyst for social reforms. Thus, both are essential for the progress of a civil society. However, at times, these two pillars of democracy are at loggerheads. Under the fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression, The media claims the right to investigate, to reveal, to expose and to highlight the criminal cases. According to it, in a democracy the people have the right to know. Therefore, the media has a corresponding duty to inform the people about the criminal and the crime. It, thus, demands the right to carry on pre-trial publicity. Yet, on the other hand, The judiciary is keenly aware of the fundamental rights of the accused to a fair trial and of due process of law. Since pre-trial publicity can derail a fair and a speedy trial, the judiciary has to balance the competing fundamental rights. While the freedom of speech and expression of the media, the right to know of the people need to be protected and promoted, The right to fair trial of the accused needs to be secured and guaranteed. Media is regarded as one of the pillars of democracy. It has wide-ranging roles in the society.
media plays a vital role in molding the opinion of the society and it is capable of changing the whole viewpoint through which people perceive various events. The media can be commended for starting a trend where the media plays an active role in bringing the accused to hook. Free speech and expression is perhaps one of the most important and useful rights available in our constitution. Freedom of expression incorporated in the Indian constitution under its Article 19, 1, A, grants freedom of speech and expression to its citizens. The freedom of press is a necessary element of the freedom of expression that involves a right to receive and impart information without which democracy becomes an empty slogan. But this right is not absolute and is subjected to the reasonable restrictions of defamation and contempt of court among others mentioned in clause 2 of the above mentioned article which clearly states that this right can be restricted by law only in the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India, the security of the state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency or morality or in relation to contempt of court, defamation or incitement to an offence. The media pushes people to prejudge the verdicts of criminal proceedings. Some people use the media to influence court case outcomes. In media trials, the media serves as a conveyor for popular sentiment. The media are also used to practice parallel elements of justice outside the confines of the courtroom. The media are a principal pillar of democracy across the world. The media plays numerous roles in society including molding social opinions and perceptions of specific events. In recent times, the media has played a role in pushing for the trial of accused persons. The media informs the public on matters of significance to it, meaning that a healthy and free media are critical to the working or functioning of democracy. Court proceedings that are covered widely by the media are concluded by the courts rather fast by and large. What is media trial? Trial is essentially a process to be carried out by the courts. The trial by media is definitely an undue interference in the process of justice delivery. Before delving into the issue of justifiability of media trial it would be pertinent to first try to define what actually the trial by media means. Trial is a word which is associated with the process of justice. It is the essential component on any judicial system that the accused should receive a fair trial. India is a country where all the people have an upsurge of curiosity to know about the sensational and the high-profile cases. People themselves start collecting information to lead the case in their mind and in this process the media by publishing their own versions of facts in the source of newspapers, news websites, and news channels pour water on the people's thirst for these sensational cases. This is known as investigative journalism, which is permissible in India. The power of the influence and revolutionizing the mass in creating perception against a guilty or innocent mind is known by trial by media or media trial. Trial by the media is not merely a legal issue. It is also a political problem. On the one hand, it derails the lawmen from the legal track. On the other, it also distracts the laymen, the public in the republic, from crucial issues like economic disasters, unemployment or the growing unfreedom. Authoritarian regimes always have invisible ministries for distraction which manifest through the media that they hire. Democracy requires perpetual vigilance. Recently, 
Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph of Supreme Court of India while addressing Bar Council of India meet at Chennai on 26 July 2015 citing pressure on the judiciary during the Nirbhaya rape case had remarked that media trials in pending cases should be avoided and thereby judges saved of the enormous strain created by it. Please stop trying cases in the media till a case is over. Never try a case in the media, it creates a lot of pressure on judges, they are also human beings, referring to, the amount of pressure that is built. He recalled how a judge who dealt with the case had once told him that, had he not given that punishment, they would have hung him. The judge said, if I had not given that punishment they would have hung me. The media had already given their verdict, like, it is going to be this only. He however, added, he, the judge who went into Nirbhaya case, had reasons to give the punishment, not because the media said it, but because he had reasons. Trial by media is it a fair trial? Litigation is not always a search for truth. According to philosopher Charles Taylor, it is a zero-sum game, where the law only says either A or B is right. Media trials have always given rise to a certain kind of problem as it involves the tug of war between two different principles which are the free trial and the free press, both in which the public at large is generally invested. The freedom of the press is a part of democracy in any country. This is the kind of justification given to investigative journalism. But at the same time, the right to have a fair trial is a basic right that is given to every accused and the victim alike which is uninfluenced by any external source and is thus, recognized as a basic tenant of justice. It does not consider the multitude of truth and complexity of events, issues or individuals. British Marxist Terry Eagleton put it in perspective, courtrooms, like novels, blur the distinction between fact and fiction. The jury judge not on the facts but between rival versions of them. The Guardian, 25th May 2005, when trial by the court itself is inherently problematic in the adversarial system of justice, a media trial poses additional issues. Hate campaigns, accusations and witch hunts impact the juridical process enormously. They also contaminate the cultural and intellectual ecology of the nation. The trial by media in their own eye may be as fair as everything is fair in love and war because they work on this principle only. Media have the ability to cause a trial by media because the public look to media as a reliable source of information. This was also held by the English court in the case Johnson, 2016 p. 381, therefore media acts as a public court or a junta court where they decide the culprit soon before the commencement of the proceedings. The media by reporting consistently on a person who is convicted in a trial forces the public to make perception for that person as an accused which results in the guilt of the accused before proceedings even begin. Hence, the trial by the media is not as fair as they have no power to interfere and to force the public to make an opinion against an individual. The media by doing the pre-trial interferes in the procedure and mechanism of the judiciary which is not permissible under any law or act. Restrictions by the Constitution and the Contempt of Court Everything in this country has a limitation to its nature be it a right or freedom similarly. The freedom of speech and expression as guaranteed under Article 19, 1, A, of the Indian Constitution has also been restricted with some reasonable measures under Article 19, 2, of the same Act.
The clause 2 of the article says that the state has the power to make any law to impose any restriction for the freedom of speech and expression and on the same page no one is allowed to use this right as against the sovereignty, integrity and security of the nation or against any friendly nation with other states or against any public order, defamation and incitement to an offense or decency or morality in relation with the court.